We are here today to talk about SQL Server Integration Services for Developers. Um, how many have ever seen SQL Server Integration Services before? Handful? Okay. Well, this is going to be a very low-level introductory session, and it's going to be kind of focused on things that a developer might want to use SSIS for, as opposed to your typical, say, business intelligence consultant. Uh, I think you're going to find some good uses for it in your everyday jobs, and we're going to cover some good examples of some of those. Um, a bit about myself. Uh, I am Robert Kane. Uh, I've been working with SQL Server, uh, MVP in SQL Server since 2008. I'm um, currently working as a, a consultant with Pragmatic Works. Uh, we do a lot of SSIS stuff. <sighs> no, I don't want to change the color. Go away. Yes, it's not recorded that I wanted to change the color. Um, I also do some work with Pluralsight. Uh, they're a video training company. And uh, I've done some other stuff, co-authored the MVP Deep Dives. Uh, my blog is arcanecode.com. I also started blogging on bidn.com. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter as Arcane Code. So, enough about me, you care less. Um, today is going to be a 100 level introduction to SSIS. We're going to look at some basic SSIS stuff. You'll get a feel for the environment. Hopefully you'll get some ideas out of this on what you can do with SSIS back at your uh, workplace on Monday. Um, we're going to be also one of the things we're going to look at is how to call SSIS from your, your .NET applications. So, you're probably wondering what the heck is SSIS? Um, okay. Yes, I'll change it to basic so you quit annoying me. And where do my slides go? There we go. <laughs> and that's recorded for all posterity now. Um, so, what is SQL Server Integration Services? Well, it's essentially a tool for pulling data from a certain data source and pushing it to another location. Most commonly, you see it used to go from one database to another database. But it's not limited to that. We could use it to import data from a flat file. Or we could export data from a database to a flat file. You know, how many of you here have had somebody come running up to you and going, uh, you know, George, we need to export that data from our database. We need to dump it to a flat file. We need you to rearrange these columns and concatenate these things together. And, uh, oh, we need it in 15 minutes. Okay. Everybody's had those situations before. Um, you can also do things like go from one flat file to another flat file. I had a situation some years ago where uh, we had written this application, and we had sent the vendor specifications that said, we need your flat file, and we need it to be in this particular configuration. And the vendor goes, sure, no problem. Well, the vendor delays and hems and haws, and so, you know, 24 hours before we're supposed to go to production, the vendor finally delivers the first file to us, and it's nothing like what we said we needed. So I whipped out integration services, and wrote a little quick package that would convert it from the format they sent to the format we needed, and in about half an hour, we had the thing going. You know, so we could do our testing and be ready for production the next day. Um, so that was one example where it really, you know, filled the bill and, and helped save us. Um, as I said, SSIS is most commonly used in your data warehousing slash business intelligence world, but I think there's a lot more applications for it. One big thing I've used it for is doing legacy data conversion. How many of you have been on a project where you write some brand new spiffy system that's going to replace some old COBOL system, and suddenly you go, well, I have no idea how I'm going to convert the data from the old system to the new system, because the user wants to retain all that data. SSIS is a great way to do that. It's also great for doing data exports. Like I mentioned earlier, you get the situation where they come up and go, yeah, we need this data export, and we need it on a monthly basis so that our users can do things with it. Um, another great use for it that people seldom think about is to move massive complex data processing off of the desktop or the 
.NET ASP server into the SQL Server database. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, and I'll put all these slides up, by the way. I'll put the slides up on my website uh, sometime before Monday, so you can reference them. Um, one of the things that SSIS will let you do is move all of that processing up to the, close to the database. You know, it'll sit up there on the database where the, the data is, so you can process those million records on the same server where the data is, as opposed to trying to pull all those records across the network, process them on some box, and then push them back across the network. So, where do you get SSIS from? Well, it comes with SQL Server Standard Edition. It also comes with the Enterprise Edition. But I think of importance to y'all is that it comes with the SQL Server Developer Edition. And I'm willing to wager most of you either have Developer Edition or have access to Developer Edition. So when you install it, you'll, it'll install something called BIDS, Business Intelligence Development Studio. Now, don't let Microsoft fool you. BIDS is simply Visual Studio with another name. Okay, so if you, after you install BIDS, if you go to create a new project, you'll still see your C-sharp, BB.NET stuff, but you'll have some new business intelligence and database projects listed there in your list of uh, installed components. Be aware that with the 2008, 2008 R2 version of SQL Server, you still have to have Visual Studio 2008. Okay, it's going to be the Denali, which is the next version of SQL Server, time frame before we see bids moved up to Visual Studio 2010. I personally can't wait because I love the 2010 interface. SSIS is actually very full featured. Uh, we're not going to have time to touch on a lot of these things today, but you have the ability to use variables, there's debugging tools built into it, you can do logging, you can have different configurations so as your packages move from you know, development to test to production, you just change your configuration file and you're in business. Uh, it does excellent error handling. You can include T-SQL scripts and BB.NET or C-sharp code as part of your packages. And you'll see a quick example of that. Now, there's a couple of basic concepts that you'll need to understand when you work with your SSIS packages. And we're going to see those in a few minutes. There's two major ways the data flows. The first is something called a control flow. The control flow is kind of like the orchestrator of an orchestra, orchestra conductor. Um, he basically says, you do this, you do this, you do that. And if anything you do with data works on sets of data. Okay, for example, you might issue a T-SQL statement that says, update sales table set price equal price times 1.0 or 1.1 so that you could just do mass bulk updates. We have to move into something called the data flow to work with individual rows of data. Within the data flow, we do something where you get a row of data, you transform it, process it, do things to it, and then you spit it out to the destination, and then you will get the next row of data, do something with it, send it out to the destination. And we'll, we'll see examples of this in just a few minutes. Actually, now, so let's see some code. I know, I know how much y'all love slides, and we just love to stick into the slides, but, you know, we got to jump look at code sometimes, so we might as well do that now. Uh, let's see. Here. Um, what I've done here is I've, you know, done a file new, um, in this case, project, because um, we're already in, inside of a solution. And you see here I have a new area project type called Business Intelligence Projects. Within here I've got various kinds of projects, but what we've picked for this is an integration services project. Since I've already got one created, I'll just cancel out of that. And by default, SSIS will create something just called package1.dtsx. Uh, DTSX is the extension for your SSIS packages. Um, a little marketing tidbit uh, of history. In SQL Server 2000, there was an ancestor for this product called Data Transformation Services. And 
DTS, you could do things that were similar, but Microsoft said, you know, there's a lot of limitations around this, and they ultimately wound up just chucking the whole thing, and they replaced it with SSIS. But up until very late in the development cycle, they were still calling it data transformation services. So much so that a lot of the utilities and a lot of the uh, naming conventions where you access things like variables and stuff and scripts still have the DTS name to them. And hence, you've got the DTS extension as part of your package names. And at the last second, marketing said, oh, no, we need to change that name because it's a new product. Hence, they came up with integration services. So when we open up our package, we're going to see we've got um, our control flow here. Now, we have this nice, this is called the design surface. And here is where we drop our various control flow items that do things. Down here, we have something called our connection managers. Here is where we create connections to databases, files, that kind of thing. Now, what I've got here is known as a shared data source. And I have placed this data source actually up here as part of the project. So by having this, I can just come here, right click, and I could actually put a connection in here directly. The downside to doing that with one package is not bad. If I had 400 packages, as I did on one pro particular project I worked on, can you imagine having to go through there when you move from test to production and go change all 400 packages? By using a shared data source, we can simply change one data source, and that is then rippled through all of our packages. Okay, so that's the reason behind shared data sources. So what we would just do is new connection from data source, we pick it, click OK, and it drops it in here for us, and we can then reference that within the package. And you'll see some examples of that later. Um, when we set up a data source, it's just right-click, new data source, and then we get this dialogue that you've probably seen before where it's just, hey, give us some information. We can come in here and, and edit our connection manager and so forth. So we'll just cancel out of these. Now, here within our control flow, we have a lot of things we can come drop in here. Okay? Um, one of the most common we'll see is an execute SQL task. Okay? And it draws this little box on here. When I double click on the box is where I can actually go edit the particular properties for that task. So here I could probably change the name to SQL do something. And I would set my connection here. And, you know, maybe I can actually type in a little bit longer query if I click on that ellipse and say select one or just, do, you know, do something. Click OK and OK. Okay, now I've got a task that I can then go when I run the package, the SQL task will run and, and execute whatever. I can actually have what they call precedence constraints so that if I want to run this before I run this, I can drag, drag this little green arrow over here, and most times you go top down. So now this is going to run in the package. When I say execute package, this will run first, then it's going to flow down here and run this next. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you here some of the more common things that we're going to do, um, but uh, certainly I'm not going to show you every one of them today. Um, let me just delete that because we don't need it anymore. And yes, I'm sure. Um, some of the other things you might find useful within your job. File system task. Okay? With a file system task, you can manipulate things at the file level. For example, you could combine this with, say, an FTP task. <coughs> an FTP task will allow you to FTP a file, say, from a vendor. So you could download the file from a vendor, and maybe before you download it, you want to delete two days ago file and then rename yesterday's file to say BAK. So you would have a file system task first that went out and renamed, you know, deleted the day before file, renamed yesterday's file to .BAK, and then it would flow down to the FTP task, which would go out to your vendor server 
and download a file for you, which you would then turn around and process with your SSIS package. If you, um, if you're in an environment where you still have a lot of DTS packages, I don't know if you do. Obviously, those folks who are new to this probably don't. Um, but you can actually execute those old packages using an execute DTS 2000 package task. So the beauty of that is, let's say you've got a lot of packages that are in old SQL Server 2000 stuff, and your boss is worried about, geez, you know, I'd love to go to SSIS, but I've got all these old packages. I don't want to convert all that stuff at once. You can say, no problem. I can convert these over time as we need to make changes. So you can create a master package that then goes out and runs all these old packages. And as you need to do updates, you can convert those or rewrite them from DTS 2000 to SSIS. Um, who's, who's still on SQL 2000? Oh, good. Usually I get about four or five hands, and we all have to, to give that person pity, you know. No, I, just, I just left um, reincorporation in five years. I was on migration team for the last three years, and my team was like, Wow. Yeah, it's it's always a struggle to get companies to migrate off from 2000, and some of them are just going now from 2000 to 2005. So it's it is a struggle to get that that effort done, especially when you've got a lot of servers out there. Um. Okay, we talked about that. Let me scroll down here. Um, script tasks. That should be something most of you are probably comfortable with. Within a script task, I can come here and I can create a script in either C Sharp or VB.net. If you are on 2005 version of SQL Server Integration Services, it only supports VB.net. So how many VB guys do we have here? A couple, most of the rest of y'all C Sharp? F Sharp? No. no, sorry, F Sharp's not supported. But so, you know, if you're comfortable in C Sharp, this is going to be great. VB.net, the same thing. Um, through here, remember I mentioned variables. Um, you can have variables that you can pass into your script, and we can actually edit your script, and it brings up a, a very much like a VBA for applications interface, which you can go in here and you can edit your script. You have access to this DTS library where I can get access to things like variables or the state of my app or things like that. And I can send variables in and out, do processing, have access to the full .NET library. I want to caution you all, though, that this doesn't mean that when I open up an SSIS package, I should see one script task with everything done in it. Okay? But it's, it's really meant for doing advanced things that SSIS natively doesn't support. A good example is the math libraries in .NET have a lot of financial uh, calculations built into it. Uh, another example that I have used this for is cryptography. Um, we've had requirements where we store our um, the uh, connection string information to the various systems we need to talk to in a file, and that we have to encrypt those before we write them out there. So when we read them in, obviously, we have to decrypt them, and I've used a script task to do that very thing. And we'll just close this. Y'all stop me if you have questions. I mean, feel free. Um, we have a send mail task so that if something breaks, you can have, say, an error handler that goes out and sends an email to the DBA that says, help! This package died. Call somebody. Do something. Um, let's see. Some of these you'll probably not touch. Um, XML tasks are obviously for performing XML items on data. Um, going back to the top, we do have the concept of looping. Um, we can do a for loop container. And in a for loop container, you drop other items inside of it, and then it will iterate over this particular item 
you know, however many times you give it, you know, one to two, one to five, one to ten, one to twenty. Um, it's just a t you know traditional for loop, increments by whatever you know you give it. There is also a, a much more useful for loop. Yes, um, and then this it's a for each loop. Now for each loop is really useful because you can iterate over a lot of different things. I could iterate over a collection that I just type in to my container. Okay, so maybe I've got three different plants I have to process for. I could just key in the names of those plants and just have it iterate over those. Um, another thing I could do is iterate over like a, a directory. So I could say for each data file in this directory, go do something. You know, import it. And that way I could have a variable number of data files out there. Um, another thing I, you can do is you can run an execute SQL task and return a certain amount of data and then pass that data to the for each loop. Okay, so I could do a, you know, select, you know, records to be processed from staging table and then it'll use each one of those, say, as a key to then go off and do whatever tasks you've placed inside the for each loop. Okay. One of the more useful looping. Um, there's also something called a sequence container. Sequence containers are useful for grouping tasks together. They just ensure that all of these items will complete before you go off and do something else. Um, I use them mostly either around organization or around making sure that a transaction applies to all of the items in a sequence. And we'll just delete that. It, you know, it doesn't automatically build the transaction, um, but SSIS supports transaction processing. You have to be running, I think it's MSMQ on your server, and then you have to go set some stuff in your package. So we can talk about that more later. It's, um, you can do ActiveX script tasks. Um, please don't. <laughs> uh, you can do a bulk insert task. In case you need to do bulk inserts to your database, um, you can do data mining. Data mining is pretty cool because you can uh, execute a data mining query against a database and do things like predictive analysis. Um, and last year, I did a project where uh, we had a customer who manufactured something. I, I'm not really at liberty to get too into details, but he was a manufacturer and his the orders for his product were variable based upon, you know, time of the year, uh, certain weather conditions, that kind of thing. So by using some predictive analytics built into SQL Server's data mining, we were able to take his historical data and create automated orders for future orders. Okay, so it just automatically created, oh, you want 15 of these, 20 of those, that kind of thing. Um, the biggest task, though, that you're going to use is called a data flow task. The data flow task is where we work with those individual rows of data. So let's jump into here. This is a data flow task. And here inside my data flow task, we start with a source. Okay, and we have a variety of sources we can pull from. We can pull from an ADO.NET source. We can pull from an Excel file. We can pull from a flat file. Remember I mentioned we, we could do flat files. And this flat file can be a lot of different formats. Fixed width, comma delimited, um, a special delimiter that you choose for yourself, like a pipe or a, uh, I had one customer used carays, you know, that shift six, the little funky triangle. Um, they use those. So you can kind of set all of that up. You can tell it, now it's got fixed width fields, variable length fields. Um, you can tell it, my end, end of row is a carriage return line feed, a line feed, a spe, again, a special character of some kind. So you can set up all of that um, and customize it how you need to. We also have uh, OADB as a source, so you can connect. And OADB is probably the one you want to use the most it's for connecting to databases. Um, you have an XML source if you want to read data from an XML file. Then you have this interesting thing called a raw file. 
SSIS will let you both write to and read from something called a raw file. It is a native file format just for SSIS. The idea behind it is I can then break my processing down into multiple packages. So I can take a package and have it do a bunch of stuff and then write that data out to a raw file. I then can go off and run another package, do something, process, and then I can have my third package read that original raw file, or maybe both packages spit out raw files, and in my third package I can then read those both in, combine that data together, and keep processing. The reason Microsoft created this special raw, that's a binary format, is that it's extremely fast. So if you need to temporarily stage data somewhere, you can stage it to the raw file and then pick it back up later. Uh, it's written to the local hard drive. Um, they should be because it's just a file. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's just a file that sits on the hard drive. I've, I've never tried that, but it. In, I think so. Now, I've, I'm not going to swear to that because I've never tried it. From what I know about it, in theory, that should work. Uh, unless they're doing, you know, SSIS has some encryption involved, unless they're doing something there with the server encryption keys. Um, but it's a good, you'll we'll have to try that sometime. Um, now, in order for a package to work, in order for you to be able to execute it, it has to have both a source and a destination. Okay, it's got to have those two components before you can do anything with the package. So when we come down here and look at our destinations, we've got quite a variety. We have ADO.net. We have a data mining model, data reader. Um, some of the ones you guys really care about is like, for example, the ADO, uh, an Excel destination, a flat file destination, and a LayDB destination. Um, there's the raw file I mentioned. Um, you can also use SQL Server Compact Edition, which is a pretty cool little database. Uh, if you've never looked into SQL Server Compact, hit my blog. I got a bunch of entries on SQL Server Compact Edition. Um, you can also go right to a SQL Server destination. You're going to write directly to a SQL Server. Um, most common, though, people mostly use a LayDB so they can keep it kind of database agnostic somewhat. So if I drag in a LayDB on here and set them both up, then I'll be able to have my data flow from here to here. When I open up my LADB source, you can see I have to set up things like what where do I want to pull stuff from. Um, we'll just pick that. You can see the columns I have. And she says, here's all the columns. If you don't want any, you can uncheck some. I can actually, instead of a table or view, I can say I want to pull from a SQL command. Or I can have a SQL command that I've stored in a variable. Um, how many of you guys have to work with Oracle? Oh, good. Oh, one guy in the back. Okay. Well, with a SQL command, SSIS supports parameters. So you could write your SQL to have you know, parameters in there, but unfortunately Oracle does not. So you actually have to use a script task to concatenate your SQL select string to a variable, and then you would just use that here um, within your, your source. Um, and I'll show you some real examples of that in a few minutes. And then your destination is kind of the same thing. Yes, um, you would map your, your source columns to your target columns, and you can identify the table, um, or you can use a SQL update command, you know, whatever you want to use. Um, now, obviously, most of the time you're not going to be able to do a straight, you know, from A to B type thing. You're going to have to manipulate the data do some transforms. So to handle that, Microsoft provided us a whole long list of data flow transformations. Um, I'm going to show you, if, I'm just going to let you look at a few of them real quick because we're, we're you know, already getting into time. Um, one particular type is called an aggregate. An aggregate is useful for doing an average or a sum, something like that. Now, 
most times I suggest people when they need to do that push that to the database level. So for example, select some of product sales uh, group by product. You know, push that into your SQL statement and let SQL do it for you. But what if you're reading from a flat file? Okay, you can't do that with a flat file. So the flat file, you often have to do these aggregations using an aggreg aggregate uh, transform. Um, some others you might use, a conditional split is pretty much what it sounds like. You, it comes in and based upon some column of data, you can then split your data flow, these little green things, into multiple branches. Um, data conversion is another one you'll use quite a bit. Um, I've got a string that I need to convert to an integer, maybe I've got an integer I need to convert to a string, um, that kind of thing. Um, the derived column, you'll see an example of this in a minute. In a derived column we, is where we do things like calculations or uh, looking up, say, substrings, that kind of thing. Uh, so you can actually create new columns to add to your data flow. Um, let's see, lookups are another one you're going to use a lot. A lookup is where you can grab data from another table. So for example, I'm reading in data from a flat file and I need to validate that a certain piece of data actually exists in the target database. So I could use a lookup and say, hey, go get me the primary key for John Doe and bring it into my data flow. Okay. Um, a merge brings two data sets together. Um, a merge join brings two sorted data sets together. Okay. Um, a multicast will actually send the same record to multiple destinations. Um, I used a multicast in a system where the, the, our requirement was when we pulled records in, they wanted a copy of that record written to a history file. The history file just had records keep adding to it. The other one, the other branch, they wanted to actually go update their production system. Okay, so to accomplish that, I used a multicast and I just, you know, one went to the history data source, the other one went to the production data source. Um, and a LADB command lets you issue, just what it sounds like, in a LADB command, such as an update, against the target database. It's useful, but be aware that it can be extremely slow. Okay? So if you're working with a couple hundred records, go ahead and use a LADB. If you're working with a couple million records, avoid a LADB. Um, Another one I'll show you here is row count. If you recall earlier, I said every package has to have a destination. Well, row count's interesting in that it will act like a destination. Okay, so back to the example I just gave you, when I was developing that particular SSIS package, I had the multicast, and then I wanted to test the history branch. So for the branch that was, go was eventually going to go to production, I just stuck a row count there. And what the row count does is for every record that passes through, it just increments a variable that you place in your package by one. So, you know, you might have records to production variable, and one, two, three, four, five. But SSIS will allow you to just have a dead end there and let the row count just be the end of that particular data flow. So using that, I placed a row count there temporarily and then I was able to write all of the logic and test it for the history. And then when I was done, I went back, deleted the row count, and I wrote the logic to say, go out here and write this to production now. So a row count can be a pretty handy little tool, especially during development. Uh, let's see. A script component is useful for writing um, .NET code that affects that individual record. And I've got an example of it I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, a, uh, let's see, the sort is probably the uh, next to the last one I want to show you. A sort simply does what it says, sorts a record. Um, now, but what sorts are useful for, for is working in conjunction with a flat file. Um, you can read in a flat file, sort it in the correct order, 
And then you can use that merge join to join that sorted data with maybe sorted data that you've read out of a, a database using, you know, order by XYZ. Merge those together. Uh, the last one is union all. You could have a situation where you're doing a multicast, sending data out to multiple branches to do different things, and then you want to join all that back together. Most commonly, though, what I use a union all for is a situation where you do a lookup to go get a piece of information. And then, uh-oh, that piece of information wasn't found when we did the lookup. So I would branch off to, say, a derived column transformation where I would create, you know, maybe a bogus record that says, uh, use this value to indicate that it's not there. Okay. So, for example, maybe I go look up a date to get a date stamp of some kind. Oh, I didn't find this, you know, maybe somebody fat-fingered the date and created 11200. So I would come back and say, no, no, for missing dates, we're just going to use 1231 I'm going to replace it. And then for data that was found, I'm going to come out my normal lookup, and then I'll put those together using a union all. Okay. Um, let's actually go see some examples of stuff that actually works. Yeah. In this particular example, um, there we go. In this particular example, I've got all of one uh, control flow items, and it's my data flow task. When I open it up, you can see it's extremely simple. I have my source, which comes from this connection manager in AdventureWorks. When I open it up, you can see I'm doing a select statement, and I'm joining data together from several different tables. My output is a list of columns right here, and I have the option of, of renaming columns if I want to. So for example, I could rename order date, and I could type in order date if I want to. So this is one place where I could do things to rename columns. And then I've got a flat file destination. Now here my sales output flat file, I've specified that I want the flat file to be in this particular folder. Uh, presentation SQL Server SSIS for devs, sales output .csv. So this is going to be a comma separated value file. Um, it's going to be delimited. My text qualifier is a double quote. My header row is going to be um, differentiated by a carriage return line feed. For an output file, the header rows to skip doesn't mean anything. If this was an input file, then I can indicate that um, my file actually had one row or two rows, or how many it had, with headers in it. Um, in the columns, it shows us what the data is going to look like. And here in the advanced, you can see where you can actually go into each individual item. And you can actually make alterations, like the output column width, that kind of thing. Here in the item itself, I've said our flat file connection manager is the sales output that was in my connection managers. And in our mappings, I have mapped the available input columns to the destination columns. By default, SSIS will help you out by automatically mapping your input columns to the destination columns based upon the column name. So if you remember a minute ago, I showed you that you could rename columns either within the SQL select statement, or you could do it when you actually uh, in the de in the source dialog box. So when you do that, you're already using the same name as the destination. It makes it much easier to track as you work your way through the logic of the package. So when I run this, you see what's going to happen is this task turned green, and then within here, this one also turned green. I shrink that down some. And you can see it tells me it read 31,465 rows and wrote those out to my Excel file. Okay. Um, this is an extremely simple one, but it's you know a nice one to get started with. Now, something else to show you. The package is actually still running. Okay. It doesn't actually stop running until you either come up here and hit the stop debugging button or you click on this right here. 
Now, the reason they do that is so that you can come and look at the state of things like variables, progress, that kind of thing. SSIS will save your package execution process. And it, this is actually the package explorer. Put the wrong tab. Here's the execution results, and it tells us as it works through the various tasks it has to do, what it did. And down here at the very bottom, you can see that we have our start and finish time. And if there were any errors, it would show them to us. This particular case is not running as a transaction. You can set up transaction processing. Um, it's kind of a complex subject, so I'm not going to go into it right now. But you can set up transactional processing within your packages. Um, there is a package explorer that sometimes can be useful for, um, like here's all the variables. It's got a bunch of system, you know, built-in variables to the system. And then you can also add your own variables to the package. Um, here's the connection managers, the executables. Here's the variables again, the components. So you can use here, this uh, package explorer as an alternate way of doing things. I think I mentioned in the earliest slides, SSIS also supports event handlers. Event handlers can be really handy for doing like your on error tasks. You know, you can come over here and any error that the package has will cut, roll up here to this particular error handler and you can come here and add uh, transformations and tasks and whatnot to handle things like writing out to an event log. Okay, that was that simple one. Let's actually look now at an example of we're going to import a file. And here, what we're going to do is we've got a, a, a table out there called mailings. Um, and in the SQL task, we've got a very simple task, which is delete from DBO mailings. And you can see here, um, here's my mailings table. And when I run this, you can see I've got no data in it. Come back over here. This is X for devs. Um, we'll cancel that. The next thing it's going to do is import our mailing data in this data flow task. And here I've got my source. I've indicated this comes from a flat file. Here's the columns that are coming in. But now I want to do something here in my derived column. Here in the derived column, I'm actually taking some new fields. I'm creating a full name column. And I'm, to do so, I'm taking my first name column, putting a space after it. And then I check to see if my middle name is null. If it is, I just put double quote, double quote. Else, which is after the colon, I actually return the middle name. After that, I have my last name. Okay, and the reason I do this is to prevent having that space space that happens sometimes. And I've said this is going to be a string, and here's its length. Uh, do the same for city state zip, and then there's the street line one and street line two. Okay. Um, so what this is just kind of a simple example of using a derived column transformation to put new data into my pipeline. No. <laughs> I just picked a big number just so it'd be, yeah. Um, here is my um, target, which is my data mailings table. I click on mappings. You can see where I've got the things mapped over. When I go execute this package, you can see yellow as it's progressing. There's my, my final, you know, yay, everything's okay. How many rows got written? 31,000. And if I come over here, you can see I run this mailings again now. You can see I've got my 31,465 rows in the table. And you can see that ran pretty darn fast importing all that data. Okay, let's go look at another example. How am I doing on time? I've got about 20 minutes left. Is that right? We end at 3. Is that right? Close enough. 
Um, here's an example of where we're going to take data from one database to another. So again, I want to delete what's in the mailings table, and I'm going to migrate that data. And this time, we're going to pretend, even though I'm pulling it off from the same place, that I'm having to go pull stuff from multiple databases. So I start off with just a simple select statement where I'm pulling data in from a SQL Server database. And then I have to come down here, and I'm going to do a lookup. And in the lookup, I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to pass in the customer ID. So my customer ID is coming in the source. I'm going to go to my customer table. Here I've used a select statement. Select customer ID, person ID from sales.customer. So I only get the fields I need. It's kind of a, a good tip for working with a lookup is only get the columns that you need. And I'm going to show you a couple other things about that and why in a second. But um, here we, we go get the customer ID and we add the person ID to our output flow. Now, over here on the general tab, there's a few things you need to know about. The first is cache mode. In cache mode, you've got full cache, partial cache, and no cache. Full cache, before the package runs, goes out there, executes that SQL statement, or goes and gets all the data from the table, and loads all of that into memory before it tries to run the package. Okay. So if your database is you know, a couple thousand customer names, then that makes a great amount of sense to cache, especially if you know where you're going to be working with the majority of those customers. If, however, that during an import, maybe you've got, you know, 50 million rows in your database, but at any given time, you're only going to work with, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand, you can do something called a partial cache. In a partial cache, SQL Server will first go look to see if the record you're looking up is already in the cache. If so, it just uses that record out of the SQL Server's memory cache. If not, then it goes to the hard drive, pulls that record out of the database, puts it in the cache, and uses it. Okay, So that's particularly useful if you're targeting a large database and you've got records that you're going to use over and over. The final option is no cache, which is just what it says. It goes to the target database every time. Okay. Uh, no, it's until the pack while the package is running. Yes. Well, it depends on your database coalition. Yeah, it, it's if your database coalition is set to case insensitive, then. Uh, it's not, you know, case sensitive when you're comparing the strings. But if it, I think by default it is set to case sensitive, um, which is the default. So in that case, you're right. If you get uppercase John and lowercase John, they're going to be two different strings, and both of them will go to the cache. So good point. Down here at the bottom, we have specify how to handle rows with no matching items. We can simply choose to ignore it. Okay. Uh, maybe it's a column that can be null, and we don't care if we find it or not. You know, if we find that particular uh, piece of information, great, we're going to put it in there. If not, no biggie, we'll just keep processing. We can choose to redirect rows to an error output. Okay, we're looking up something that should be there. There's no reason why it shouldn't, except if it's not. In which case, we're going to redirect it to an error output, and we're going to do something with that. You know, maybe we're going to do a send mail task to somebody. Maybe we're going to write it out to some kind of a uh-oh log, something like that. Um, there is the fail component, which is the default, which means your package will come to a grinding halt and stop processing if it does not find that particular item. The, the last option is actually new in 2008 and redirect rows to a no match output. And basically, you can then have two outputs coming out of the lookup. The one output is, I found it. The other output is, I didn't find it. What was happening is, in SQL Server 2005, a lot of people were, were having to use the error output as the no match. Because a lot of times, well, no match wasn't an error. It just means it didn't find it. 
So in 2008, Microsoft said, okay, so we're going to add a second, you know, match or no match. So, um, and that's probably one you'll use the most, and then you'll put some other task out there to handle the records that it didn't find. Um, and I do these multiple lookups. For, um, I do a derived column, and then I put that data out there to the mailings table. And if I run it, you can see the data flows through there, and I've written my 31,000 rows. The last sample I want to show you here um, is my script component. You can, just like I had a script task in my parent level uh, in the control flow, I can also have one here inside the data flow. Um, in here, I pull in my source, which I just did a select description from product description. I then have a script, and what I did was uh, I convert this to a base 64. So here in my input columns is the description coming in. In the output columns, I've said, okay, this one gets defined by default, the input, because it's coming from the, the, the previous component. And I've had to add manually my output column. I, I named it encrypted description. And you just, you know, right click here. Um, oh, you come down here and say add output. And then it would pop up here and you name it and tell it, oh, it's a string, length of a thousand. I just kind of arbitrarily pick that. Um, and once I've got that, I can come here and edit the script. And I chose C sharp for this. And the script is basically down here. Um, it says, um, I want to process the input row, and it gives me a variable called row of type input zero buffer. And here you can see what I did was um, a very simple um, ASCII encoding, converted the row dot description field to string, and this converts it to an encoded bytes. Um, I then set a variable I just called return value to system.convert.2base64 string, and I passed the byte array, which I created here, into it. And then finally, for the row output, row.encrypted description equals return value. Okay, and that's just kind of one example, um, pretty simple, just doing a, a base64 encoding to a particular description. It's kind of a weird example because it's probably not something you'd ever want to do, but I could see that if you wanted to take that description, package it up, and send it over the internet in kind of a plain text format, something that wouldn't you know, kind of mess up a URL or something like that. But anyway, um, I would then have that as you know an input and an output, and then I have it to write out here to my product table. Okay, and I won't even. In the interest of time, I don't even want to run that right now. Because the other thing I want to show you is it's definitely possible to call SSIS from .NET. A couple different ways you can do it. Um, the first is when you have your SSIS package, one of the properties under deployment is to allow you to create a deployment utility. Okay. Here, by default, right now this is set to false, so I can change it to true, in which case it's going to set up a bin deployment folder. Um, once I have my bin deployment folder, where did my command go? There it is. Oops. Come on, fat fingers on the mouse. Um, here, in my um, deployment, I've got a um, particular package I call load DNR shows. We're going to look at that in a minute. And it has this deployment manifest. So I could just, from within like my Explorer window, double click on this and it will walk me through the steps of installing this to either SQL Server or the SQL Server file system. Okay, so that's how I can get this up on a server. My other option though is I can just type in dt exec and then type in the name of my DTS package and it would actually run it. So from a .NET app, I could actually shell out and run this DT exec command line and execute the package. Downside to that is um, you actually have to deploy the package along with your, your .NET stuff, or you have to have it up on a server somewhere where your code's running. 
Okay, so it's not the best solution in the world. Um, I will mention real quick, if you do run around the package, you can see about a bazillion options in here. Now, I have used this before when I had uh, a couple hundred packages I wanted to process. It was a one-time thing. I didn't want to have to upload everything to the server, so I just created a big batch file with a bunch of DT exec commands in it, one for each package, and I was able to just type in go, and it just ran all this stuff for me. Um, there's an awful lot of things here to configure, though. So they have another tool called DT exec UI, and it brings up this nice um, package utility, and I can step through all these items and configure everything like I want it, point to the server, I can overwrite configurations, I can overwrite connection strings, and when I'm done, okay, I can go to this command line, and it will have a nice little box that I can just copy and paste the command line and then save it out and run it. Now, um, if I double click on that deployment utility, I can actually step through the steps to actually go run, load it to the server, which I've already done. And what I've got is a fairly simple little application. Um, how many of you guys are, are podcast listeners? Okay, you should check out podcast, great tool. .NET Rocks, anybody listen to it? Okay. I've got a, a flat file that has just a list of .NET Rocks episodes, and it's just got the show number, the show title, and the show, uh, the date the show appeared. So what I want to do is take that data and get it up to the server, and I'm going to process it on the server. So what I've got is a very simple little utility, and the first thing I'm going to do is load that data up to the staging server. So I just clicked on that, and my data has been loaded, and that code is very simple. Um, I just used an ADO.NET connection because I figured that's something everybody's done at some point. And if I actually come over here, um, let's close that. Yeah. Um, and I've got a staging one. What is that so big? Um, here's where I've got my staging table set up, and you can see it's just a single column that has the show data in it. Okay. And then I've got a package called load DNR SSIS in which, you know, it uses that table as a source, splits it up using a derived column transformation, and I just use substrings to kind of divide it up, looking for the first space and the last space, and then kind of split it up. And it split this single column into three columns. Again, this is a real trivial example, but it writes it out to another table and in this other table, I actually have three columns. And you can see right now there's nothing in this table. So, I don't want to run this, though, from SSIS. Okay, because you're not going to run packages from bids every day. What you actually want to do is get this up on the server. So, I used my deployment tool to deploy this to SQL Server. And it's just a wizard. You can just walk through the steps. And once I had it up here, I've got my package up here called Load DNR Shows. Now, again, I could right-click and say, ex, you know, execute package, wherever it's at, um, run package. And it would run, and it would do the job. But again, you don't want to sit here and do that. So I can come over here to the SQL agent, and you can see here I've created a job called Load DNR Shows. And I could schedule this job. If I wanted to, you can see here I've just got the job and under steps, I've got a single step called run the package, and in here there's the package name, load DNR shows. And again, I apologize for going through this so quick, but we're, we're just about running out of time. Here though, once I've got the job set up, I could schedule it, but that's not very efficient for you because you want to be able to run this on command from your .NET app. So to handle that, I have uh, in this WinForms app, I've got a property, excuse me, a, a click event set up for that second button. And what this does is it connects to my local SQL server, and then I simply execute a SP start job command, and I start my load DNR shows job, and that job kicks off my package. Okay, so when I actually run this, there it be. I'm going to execute that SSIS. It's going to tell me it's been executed. Now, one of the little caveats is 
it doesn't actually give you any feedback. It's a one-way trip. So you just execute the job. And what I would recommend you do is have something in the job that writes out a success thing to a record somewhere and that within your application you just keep polling that you know are you finished running yet table or maybe you can return a status that says hey your package is 50% done 70% done however you choose to do it there's just some sort of a notification system so that you'll know for sure when it's actually done so now when I come back over here to management studio and I now run this Here we can see I've actually split this out into three different columns. Now, again, this is a super trivial example, but can you imagine if you had a billion columns that you needed to do processing to, you're obviously going to get a huge speed boost if you can get that processing up on the server instead of pulling each one of those records down to your workstation, processing it, and shoving each record back. So that's two different ways you could do it. You can call DT exec, or you can actually execute the package up on the server. Uh, let's jump back. You have to have, if you have bids installed, um, you can execute your SSIS stuff. Um, I'm not sure if you actually have to have a full SQL developer, if you can just do bids. Let me check on that. Um, let me jump back over here. In our last uh, three or four minutes here, um, I'm going to show you a few resources around learning more. If you've you had your appetite whetted and you're like, hey, this SSIS stuff's pretty cool, I can think of some uses for it. Um, a couple of good books out here. Um, Eric Bierman and Brian Knight are two guys I like a lot. Little disclaimer, I now work for Brian Knight, but at the time I put the slide deck together, I did not. Um, but he's got a couple of really good books out here. Um, and this is actually the training kit for Microsoft for you know, SSIS, among the other tools that are part of uh, business intelligence. Um, there are some good demo sites um, here in the SQL Server samples. A lot of people know about AdventureWorks, but what they don't know is AdventureWorks, in addition to the database, you can also download full-blown projects for SSIS, AS, and reporting services. So you can get full-blown sample projects. I will mention the SSIS package. Last time I looked at it, it was really, really ugly. So do not use it as kind of a gospel kind of package. Um, they tried to, to load a huge database in one single package, which is not the right way to do it. Um, you're, you're much better off breaking things in smaller chunks. And remember, there was an execute package task. In addition to the execute DTS package, there's also an execute package task that's part of the control flow. And you can use that to, to manage running a whole bunch of different packages. And that's commonly the way things are done. Um, some other resources I've put in the slide deck, some blogs, some podcasts you can go find, um, some various sites that you can go to. I um, want to mention the book real quick, uh, SQL Server MVP Deep Dives. All the proceeds from the book go to charity. So far, we've raised over $21,000 for this War Child International Fund. They're a non-denominational group that provides needs to kids in war-torn countries. So, you know, food, water, clothing, shelter first. Then they get on to doing things like education. So it's a good cause, and, you know, this book's got a huge... Huge thick book, and we're actually working on a volume two now. Um, where I'm going to be at next, just in case you've decided that I'm really cool and you like me, uh, I'm there, we're doing a SQL Saturday in Birmingham on July 30th. So if you feel like coming down and getting some really good barbecue, uh, Birmingham's the barbecue capital of the world. We've got more barbecue restaurants per capita than anybody else in the world. So we've got it all. Uh, I'll also be down at DevLink. I know you've seen John Keller running around here. I'm doing three different sessions at DevLink. Yeah, I'm a glutton for punishment, I know. Um, and also, I just found this out today. Next week, on Thursday, I'm doing a uh, webinar for uh, Pragmatic Works, the company I work for. Um, and that, that's going to be on uh, database development uh, edition. So, um, 
free training. It's also going to be recorded, so if you can't watch it during the day, um, you can catch it, you know, at your leisure. And it's just you know, pragmaticworks.com, and you'll see the list of webinars. Um, I think that's about it. That uh, puts us, you know, a minute or two on schedule. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm here. Uh, I've also got a whole stack of business cards where you can get my contact information, so feel free to grab uh, as many of those as you want to. They're also pretty stiff plastic, so they're good for jimmying up in the, the drawers of your coworkers, breaking into the bathroom at work, somebody's locked the door from the inside, stuff like that. So, um, questions? Yes. So you've got table A, table A has, has a, a dependency on table B. So I would import table B, okay? and then when I go to import table A, I would use a lookup to ensure that my required piece of data is already in table B. Okay? If it is not there, then I have a couple of options. I could choose to add it at that point. I could choose to ignore that row from table A and simply not import that row. Let's say it's there, but the problem is now my, my identity keys are different on the two different databases. So my columns on my... Oh, on my yeah. 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 Yeah.